All right, we're, we're live. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, for those in the channel, if you can hear us, uh, could you uh, uh, type a message? Can you hear us okay? Yes, okay, perfect. All right, let's get started. Um, today, uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Morden Dale. Uh, to talk about privacy preserving machine learning um, in, in TensorFlow. Uh, Morton Dale is a computer scientist uh, with an interest in crypt cryptography, machine learning, and programming languages. Uh, Morton received a PhD in, his, uh, in cryptography at uh, Aarhus University and received a master in computer, si uh, theoretical computer science at uh, Albert University. Uh, so, I'll pass the mic to, to Morton, uh, and uh, Morton, um, before we start, I'm a little curious about uh, uh, your role at the Dropout Labs, and what does drop, Dropout Labs do? Could you give us a little introduction? Yeah, sure. So, hi everyone, and thank you for, for having me. Um, so, I'm Morton, and I work as a research scientist at, at Dropout Labs, uh, where I'm trying to combine uh, my background in cryptography uh, with machine learning. Um, so the basic idea of what we're building is, is a platform for uh, how do you do machine learning in a sensible way or reasonable way uh, when you start to deal with uh, sensitive information. So how do you add privacy uh, to machine learning uh, in order to open up for new uh, business use cases? And one of the things we've been working on is how to actually do this directly in TensorFlow. So I'll get into a bit why yeah, that's interesting, uh, but from a broad perspective, it's simply to make this, these technologies more accessible to a larger audience um, and kind of try to push them out of, of academia. Um, so the talk today will be a, a quick overview uh, of how this works. Uh, I'll try not to go into too many technical details. I know there's, there could be a lot in the slides. Um, so there'll be one half, which is, is a bit about how this stuff is even possible. So it's less, maybe it's less magical. And then the second part is around how you can, uh, some concrete examples of how you can do this using uh, TF Encrypted. Um, so to get started, uh, the first question is, is why? Why is it interesting to have this privacy in machine learning? And uh, in order to frame that, a one perspective seen that is that if you look at the normal process that a company that wants to train a prediction service, uh, they have to go through, um, it will be that they often start out with a data set, they run that through a training process, and then they offer that the, the resulting model uh, as part of a prediction service. But then, of course, this process exists in a larger context. And the first question is, how do you get this data set? And it could be an internally de generated data set, but often you'll also see that these companies will have to go out to external parties and actually get the data set. So it could be a public data set like ImageNet, but it could also be that they have to go to specialists or experts uh, that's build up these data sets and are willing to offer them as for, for training purposes. Or they might have to go out to other companies and actually buy data sets for them saying, so uh, we would like to perform business analysis. Uh, can we get access to your data set? And likewise, on the other side, uh, there's also uh, how are they going to use this prediction service afterwards? And this would often involve some kind of customer that wants to say, uh, I generate a new input, I send it to you, you run it through your prediction, your model, uh, and you send back the, the result of this to me. To give a very concrete example, uh, there was this group of researchers about two years ago uh, that developed a small app for doing skin cancer uh, image classification. So the idea is that they have a small app, small Android app, uh, you can take a photo of a skin lesion. That photo gets sent through a prediction service running a convolutional neural network. And then you get back an answer of whether or not you should go see a dermatologist. And the way they built the service was they went to a lot of dermatologists. They gathered all these clinical photos. Um, they did some transfer learning and so on. Uh, and they actually managed to reach a prediction level of an expert dermatologist. So out of a fear of stating the obvious, um, as soon as we can start to do this machine learning on healthcare, we can now empower anyone to have an expert dermatologist in their pocket that they can use as often as they want. So it's going to have uh, potentially a huge impact here. But there's also some, some uh, privacy issues around this. And one way of framing that is to see if this company wanted to build this service, what kind of uh, bottlenecks would they might encounter? And the first one is, uh, how do they get access to this data? So if the data, uh, original data owners, if they're somehow liable for this data, then maybe they can't afford to the risk to actually give this data away for training purposes. Also, a company that's willing to sell the data, they might say, well, we can't really control how you're going to use this data. So we're going to charge a high price that the company can't afford. So the first bottleneck might actually be that the company can't get access to the training data they need in order to build the service. 
even if they do so, they also run the risk of potentially having this data. So if they store that on the servers, if we're talking about a smaller company that doesn't necessarily have the, the in-house expertise to really protect these servers um, at the level of, of, let's say, larger enterprises, if someone were to break in and actually get access to this data, it could have a, a potential uh, a huge impact on the company. So they might say, okay, we can get access to the data, but we simply can't afford the risk of, of having this data. So we're not going to build this service. Then even if they do manage to predict to build this prediction uh, model, they also run the, the, the question of how do you incentivize users to actually use this service? So going back to the concrete example of the skin cancer uh, detection, if uh, this means that users are potentially telling the company whenever they, they run a prediction, uh, whether or not they have skin cancer, then maybe users are not really incentivized to actually kind of expose themselves in this way. So you might have a very useful service, but no one wants to use it. And then finally, there's also the question of what are we leaking back through these predictions? Are we leaking something about the, the original training data that could again be a blocker for actually building the service? Uh, or are we also leaking something about the model that the company has trained, which could represent significant uh, intellectual properties? So one solution you might have heard of, uh, or at least could think of, is, is sanitation. So how can we kind of sanitize the data we're working with so that it's, it's safe to, uh, to mitigate some of these bottlenecks? And one of the concrete technologies for doing that could be uh, differential privacy. So differential privacy works by saying, as part of the training process, we're going to add a bit of noise. And then this noise intuitively gives plausible deniability, uh, or at least it removes uh, kind of personal or private information in the data set. So using this, we could imagine that um, we're only, the company is now only seeing sanitized data. So it's not really running a risk of actually holding on to this data. Um, we can also use this technology to kind of limit the leakage through the model and through the training data that's coming back uh, through the predictions. However, it's not clear how to incentivize users to use this. So the problem here is that if you try to sanitize a single input, you might add a lot of noise to this to the point where the accuracy, so the utility of the model, uh, goes down significantly. Um, and it's also in some cases not even clear how you would use differential privacy in this setting. And this also go back to, well, maybe the, the data sources or data owners we have here on the left, um, maybe they're now okay to give the data away because they added or sanitized this data. The problem is that the utility um, that we get out of this training data also goes down. So maybe we can get access to data, but the data is no longer of the quality that we actually need to build the service. Then another technology uh, is encryption, in particular what we call secure computation. So this is not the normal encryption you might be aware of. Um, this is really a, a type of encryption that allows us to compute on data. So what's going to happen here is that instead of the data owners giving the data in plain text, they're only giving encryptions of data. And then now instead of decrypting the data and then running the training, we can carry on doing the, the training process on the encrypted data without the ability to decrypt, to arrive at a, an encrypted model that we can finally decrypt um, or keep an encrypted state. And likewise, when the user wants to use the prediction service, he can also send data in encrypted state and we can still run it through the model without being able to decrypt and then send back an encrypted prediction to the user that he can then finally decrypt at the end. So if we can do this, then we can also mitigate this fish management because now the company is only seeing encrypted data. And if someone were to break in and steal that, then well, it's still encrypted data and, and they don't really know how to, to decrypt this. Uh, this would also incentivize users to actually use the service because they're now again only sending encrypted data and the company can't decrypt this. Um, but we still get the same utility as we before because we're doing exactly the same thing as we did in the, in the plain text case. We're just now doing it on encrypted data. So whatever utility or accuracy we had in the plain text case, we're going to get exactly the same here in the encrypted case. However, this doesn't tell anything about leakage for the same reason, because we are doing exactly the same computation. So if there was a leakage in the plain text computation, then there's going to be a leakage here in the encrypted computation as well. But if we can somehow mitigate that, then it could also be a way of mitigating this, this data access issue, where we're saying that, okay, now the data owners, they're only giving away encrypted data, but more or less, as we'll see, a way of implementing this or realizing this system, the data owners can actually have a saying in how their data is used. So they can say, I give away an encryption of my data, but I also want to be part of, of determining how this data is used later on. Um, and I'll go into details about how that could work. Okay, so those are two kind of uh, orthogonal approaches to, uh, to this problem. And of course, they also mix very nicely. So we could imagine this hybrid approach where we're doing the training, for instance, on encrypted data, but then we, as part of that, we're also sanitizing the model at the same time. So this means that we're now, we're now training, uh, but during that training process, we add some noise to sanitize the model or to not leak too much about the, the prediction, through the prediction. Um, and when we use the model, we're also going to use encryption uh, for this, uh, but we don't have to, to sanitize the, the prediction input. 
So if we can do that, then we can potentially mitigate all of these, these four bottlenecks. So the one I'm going to be talking about today is uh, more about secure computation. And the idea of how can we actually compute on data while it remains in this encrypted state and without the ability to, to decrypt. And to illustrate that, I'm going to take a very simple model. So let's say first we want to, to run a prediction using a linear model. And here we have the, the service just has a set of weights, a vector of weights, and the user has a vector of inputs x. He, set, he would send these across to the prediction service, the service would compute a dot product and send this back to the user. So this is the, the, the plain text case using the simplest model I could think of. And if we unraveled it a bit, we see that what the server is actually computing in this case is the component-wide uh, dot product or the uh, multiplication between the, the two vectors and then it's adding up everything afterwards. So now the first technology for actually doing this in a private way or on the encrypted data would be to use what's called homomorphic encryption. And using homomorphic encryption, there's now a key that only the data or the, the client here knows. He's going to send encryption of his input to the service. The service can now, without knowing the decryption key, so without decrypting, compute an encryption of the dot product between the two, send this back to the user, and decrypt and learn the result. And then if we plug into our equation now, we now see that all we have to do is we have to take the, the the multiplication between some kind of ciphertext and some weights, and then we have to add up all these resulting ciphertexts. So again, if, if this is a normal encryption scheme that you're perhaps familiar with using uh, HTTPS and so on, then we don't know how to do this. But for some encryption schemes, we can do this. And the first operation we have is we want to be able to do a public multiplication. So we want to take a ciphertext, an encryption of x1 in this case, and then we want to somehow manipulate it uh, using w1 to resolve to, to give a ciphertext uh, of x1 times w1. If we can do that, then we say that the encryption scheme allows us to do a popping multiplication. If we do this, then in this particular case, we end up with three ciphertexts. And now if we can somehow add these ciphertexts, so we can take two ciphertexts and we can somehow manipulate them into a third ciphertext that now contains the addition of the two plain texts. If we can do that, then we say we can do a private addition. And in particular, we say that if our encryption scheme allows us to do these two things, then we have a homomorphic encryption scheme. I'm actually not going to talk about uh, too much about these. Uh, they do exist. Um, but what I'll be talking more about is what's called secret sharing. So secret sharing has some other uh, properties. It's basically solving the same problem, but instead of having uh, a decryption key and having all the trust of the system based on this uh, encryption key, there's now a way of distributing trust. So now instead of having just one prediction service, we also need to have this helper. And sometimes this is not possible. Sometimes it's not obvious who this helper is going to be, but in the cases where it are, we'll see if this has some benefits. Um, what we can then do in this case to, for a linear model is we can say the user is now not going to send an encryption of his input, he's going to share his input into two shares. And this, this way of sharing here the input has the property that if you only see one share, then you don't learn anything about the input at all. So by doing it this way, as long as the helper and the prediction service doesn't collaborate too much uh, beyond what they're supposed to, then none of them are actually going to learn anything about X in this case. But they can still perform some computation together, some interactive computation, to arrive at a sharing of the dot product that they can then send back to the prediction client. And now knowing both shares of the dot product, the prediction client can, can reconstruct and actually learn the result that we want. Okay, and then of course, for our particular case, we also need what's called a homomorphic secret sharing scheme. So a secret sharing scheme that allows these two, uh, the prediction service and the helper, uh, to compute um, the sharing of the dot product given just the shares. Okay. And I'm going to see to show you one particular simple example for how this can be done. And we can simply say that this, the first share of X uh, is just some randomness that's also part of it. So it's just completely independent value of X. So this obviously doesn't leak anything about X. And then the second share is essentially this X masked by this randomness. This again, you can show doesn't leak anything about X unless you know R. But remember that you only know supposed to know one of these shares. So in other words, if you only know share two, then this mask, you don't know what it is, so you don't know anything about, about X. Uh, but of course, if you know both, then you can add these together, the R cancels out, and you get back X. So as a concrete example of that, we can say, okay, if we share one, or if we share five using random as seven, then the first share is seven. If we share five, or the second share of five using random as seven again, is five minus seven, so it's minus two, minus two much, the 10 is eight. So the second share is eight. And then if we have both, then seven plus eight is 15, and 15 mod 10 is five. So we recover the original X again. Okay, and then let's see how we can build our service using this, this secret sharing scheme. And let's say we have the two, um, the service and the helper, and they now have already a sharing of X and the sharing of Y, and they want to compute a sharing of X plus Y. It turns out what they can do is they can just add what they already have. So the first, 
the first share is going to be just x1 plus xy, uh, plus, uh, plus y1, and the second share is just going to be x2 plus y2. And then that's going to define a set one and a set two that adds up to x plus y. And since there was no sharing information here, then this clearly didn't leak anything about x uh, nor y. It's also very fast because there was no communication happening between these two. So essentially this happened at, at, the, at the speed of plain text. Then the second operation we needed for our service was a public multiplication. And in this case, we say that uh, there's already a sharing of x, and now there's this public y, w, sorry, that they both know, and they want to compute uh, a set, again, that's x times w. And it turns out that's also a local operation. They just multiply what they have. You can plug into the formula. You can see if you, if you rearrange a bit, and you now have a set one and a set two that adds up to x times w. Okay, so now we know using secret sharing, we know how to build a public linear prediction model or a linear prediction model uh, using encrypted data that doesn't reveal anything about, about the input. Okay, but there was one problem. So we're now, the, the prediction service is now telling this W uh, to, the, to the helper as well. And they may not want to do that depending on who the helper is. And one way around that is to say, well, we're going to secret share this W as well. So remember in this case, only seeing share two of W doesn't actually leak anything about it. Then what we have now, if we plug into our, our equation, is we need to do a private multiplication. So this now means we have to take somehow two shares and we have to manipulate them in a way so that we end up with a, a third sharing, which is now, in this particular case, uh, x0 times uh, w0. Okay, so let's say we have two shares here. We have a share of, of x, a share of y, and now we want to compute a, a set, uh, shares of a set, uh, which is x times y. It turns out, in order to do this, that's where we need some kind of communication. And without going into the details, uh, you can use some raw material uh, that I now have here on the left to compute these alpha and beta values, that if you plug into this equation, you end up with a set one and a set two that adds up to x times y. Again, I don't want to go into the details here. The main takeaway is that um, when you do multiplications on private values, or secret shared values, uh, then that's where you're going to need some communication. So that also means that multiplication in this form is now more expensive than addition. So remember addition was just a local operation that essentially the speed of the plain text, whereas multiplication now requires some interaction. Okay. Um, all right. So that was just a quick overview of some of the techniques for this. Uh, it kind of scales up to, uh, if you want to run uh, neural networks as well, uh, you can do this as I'll show now. Um, this was just the basic operations. You can add more and so on. Uh, it was mainly meant to, to illustrate that when we're now starting to build these systems, so do machine learning on encrypted data, it very much becomes a discipline that crosses different uh, domains. And one of them is obviously cryptography. So there's different techniques for optimizing this. There's different protocols that have certain trade-offs. There's this question of how do we define trust um, in the system. On the other hand, there's also machine learning. So which models are applicable to, or is particularly efficient in this domain? As we saw, addition is much more efficient than multiplication because we don't have the communication between the two parties. Um, so can we somehow tweak our models to use more additions, for instance, than multiplications? Uh, can we approximate some functions to make them easier to compute? Uh, what precision do we need to limit the data we send around and all these things? Then there's also the question of engineering, that we're now building distributed systems. Uh, so we need to optimize this kind of interactive computation as opposed to just a local computation. And then finally, there's also a question for data scientists around what are the right use cases that fit within these constraints? Uh, how does it affect the workflow when we no longer have access to the data? So imagine you're putting, uh, you're training on data that you, that you can't see. Um, how do you need to adapt that, that workflow? You should do that. Um, when you put it in production and you want to make sure that your model is still accurate, uh, how do you monitor that if you can't see the prediction input and so on? And around this question is, um, the, the outcome of this is basically we need some kind of common language for these four parties to talk in. Uh, and that's where TF Encrypted comes into it. So TF Encrypted is essentially um, based on, on TensorFlow. And it's providing a layer of abstraction where you don't have to worry about all this crypto that happens underneath. You can just use an interface that's very similar to ordinary TensorFlow um, to kind of build your, build your applications. Um, it's a normal TensorFlow the OT of encrypted architecture would be something like this, where we have your application at the top. Then for some parts, you can use TF encrypted uh, with the, the encrypted computation protocols we have implemented, uh, the machine learning layers we have. But you can also interact directly with TensorFlow uh, for some things. And I'll, I'll through the examples, I'm going to illustrate why, why that's useful. So in other words, we have ordinary TensorFlow down here uh, that you can use, we encourage you to use. You're going to have your app up here, which can be a mix of ordinary and encrypted computations. 
the idea here is that uh, if you try to move everything into the encrypted space directly, it might be very expensive. So if you can somehow find a mix between which part of my, my process do I want to do in the encrypted space, which one can I do maybe locally on some devices using ordinary TensorFlow, uh, then you're going to get much better results in terms of performance. Uh, and having this mix is, is really key, we think, to, to adapting these technologies. As I said, we also have uh, these secure computation uh, protocols directly available. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. We have we already saw additional multiplication, but we also have operations for Matmore, Relu, uh, Sigmoids, and so on. And then finally, we have down here we can we can use third-party libraries. So this is an academic discipline that's been going on for for several years, uh, going back to the 80s. Uh, and academia has already developed uh, several good projects for for doing this. And we don't want to reinvent that. So you can see STM encrypted as essentially being a bridge to these uh, to these existing projects. Uh, mixing. So in one case here, we have secure enclaves, uh, trusted execution environments. We have a morph encryption that I, I quickly talked about, and we have MPC, which is which is related to the secret shine. Okay. So moving on to the examples, uh, the first one I want to talk about is prediction, where it's about encouraging the use of the service that we have. Our setting is going to be that we have some model owner here on the left that has some weights for a model. We have a prediction service. Uh, we have the helper, and then on the right, we finally have the prediction client. As if the first step is we're going to share the weights between the, the prediction service and the helper. Then we're going to ask the prediction client to share his input. We're going to run a computation between these two. And they're going to send back, in this case, the logic. So we're doing image analysis uh, to the prediction client. If we want to express this using ordinary TensorFlow, then it could look something like this, where we first define some functions for uh, loading the values from disk. Um, Loading the image from this can do some maybe some pre-processing normalization on that, and then finally, when we then we basically define our model. So in this case, we load the weights, we load the input, uh, we run it through a few dense layers, uh, and then we send back the the logics to uh, to the receive output function, and then we run this in a normal TensorFlow session. So this is what it would look like using ordinary TensorFlow, and for anyone that has uh, some understanding of experience with TensorFlow should, should probably recognize this. If you now want to do this on private data instead, so using encryption, this is what it's going to look like. And the first thing we notice is uh, we're importing TF encrypted right next to TensorFlow. So we're not trying to replace TensorFlow, as I said. We're trying to, to really allow you to mix and take this hybrid approach between some of it is going to happen using ordinary TensorFlow and some of it is going to happen using encrypted computations through TF encrypted. Uh, then the next thing we notice is that instead of calling this provide weights directly as we did before, when we're in the setting of, of private predictions, we now have to annotate um, who actually provides these weights. And in our case, that's the model owner. So what happens under the hood here is that we're saying we're now in a system where we have several different actors. And one actor called the model owner has his own machine upon which he he's going to load the weights and then input them into this encrypted computation. And what we're instructing here is essentially to say, um, on the machine of the model owner, call provide weights, do whatever you have to do locally using ordinary TensorFlow to, to load these, uh, in our case, weights from, from disk. And then when you're done with that and you want to input them into the computation, then make sure that they actually get secret shared. So this means that the values we now have on the left here, the weights of the model, they're actually secret shared values. Likewise, for the input, we're saying that instead of calling provide input directly, call it on the machine of the prediction client well, again, you can do any preprocessing of the image you want to. And once you're done with that, uh, instead of sending that directly into the prediction service, send only secret shares of this input into the prediction service. So again, X here is going to be a secret share values. Then we define our model as we did before, and we write it with logics. These are also now secret share logics, encrypted logics, that instead of calling receive output directly on these, we're now saying send these shares of the logics to the prediction client, reconstruct the input, and then call receive output on that result. And then again, we run that using an ordinary TensorFlow session. So that's the only difference between having a, what we call, call an ordinary prediction in TensorFlow uh, and a private prediction in TF encrypted. Uh, and to some extent, that represents what's inherent when you start thinking about these privacy aspects, because it's about data ownership. And here we're really saying that the model is owned by the model owner, and he's the only one that's supposed to see these data in plain text. Whereas the prediction client is the one that owns the input and the output, and he's the only one that's supposed to see this in plain text. Everyone else can only see it in this encrypted form. Okay, so 
uh, one good thing about doing this TensorFlow is that we get access to a lot of the ecosystem tools as well. And one of them is TensorBoard. So this is taken directly from TensorBoard, where we can go in and we can inspect the computation afterwards. And what we see here is that the orange input in the box in the, in the bottom provides the model owner, uh, or the, is where the model owner provides the weights. Uh, the yellow inputs on the left is where the prediction client comes in and he provides the input and he receives the output. And then the colors in, in between is where the two compute servers, uh, the helper and the prediction uh, service, are now actually computing the input. Uh, so this is useful both to, to have an idea of what's going on, but it's also for, for privacy concerns. So if you want to go in and you want to see who actually gets to see these values, uh, TensorBoard can be, can be very useful in that. Okay, but then we can also do some, some more interesting stuff. So this was just running a prediction, but we can also consider a joint prediction. So that's where we say that now the data from, from a user doesn't actually come from one user, it can come from several users. So this is our setup. So let's say we now have three clients and they each know part of the, of the prediction input. One knows the age, one knows the gender, and one knows the income, for instance. And they're not willing to share these, maybe there's going to be sensitive information, um, but they still want to kind of combine them to join this input uh, to get a more accurate prediction. So again, we're going to start by saying, okay, our, our model owner over here is going to send shares of his, of his weights of the model to the two, to the service and the, and the helper. And then each of the uh, prediction clients are going to send shares of the features they have. We run a computation between them and we get back a, a result. I think in this case, we're using a logistic regression model uh, on these features. If we want to express this setup using TF Encrypted, this is what it looks like. So, uh, the main difference is that we're now going to say, instead of having just a single input, we're going to take these three inputs. So there's going to be an age provider. On his machine, we're going to call provide age to do whatever uh, is necessary to load this, this feature. Uh, and then when, when that's done, we're going to send uh, to SQL Share and send that SQL Sharing into uh, the prediction service and the helper. So XH here is going to be a SQL Share value. Uh, likewise for the gender and for the income. Then we're simply going to concatenate these as we would normally in TensorFlow. Um, to arrive at our X. And then we're going to take our X, run it through, uh, in this case, for the to regression, and send the result back to the, to, uh, the result receiver, uh, who is the only one that's supposed to know the result. And then run this again using uh, an ordinary TensorFlow session. Okay, we can also look at training. And here we have, let's say we have a, an expert here or someone with a, with a sensitive data set that we want to train on. He can now provide shares of his training data and send it to uh, the model owner, which is now the, the one that wants to do the training, and again, this helper. They are going to train the model together, and then they can share, they can send shares of the, of the resulting weights to the prediction service to, to be used for, for predictions. So one question here is, uh, that's this already been present, uh, who is this helper? And in this case for training, maybe it's obvious that the helper is going to be uh, the data owner. So here's really the data owner can say, I'm going to send shares of my input, but I also want to be part of the training process. I also want to know what kind of training models you're going to train on this. And I also want to control uh, how many times you do this, for instance. So I actually want to be that helper as part of the training process. And likewise, this can of course continue. So instead of saying that after the model has been trained, I'm just going to send the weights, shares of my weights to the prediction service so you can learn them. You can also choose to say, well, I want to be part of the prediction service as well. So I want to see Whenever there's a new input, I want to, to see how many times it's being used. And if you use my model more than so on so many times, uh, I'm going to pull out of it. So in other words, using SQL sharing, we can now give the data owner uh, this uh, possibility of actually being a part of the process uh, for as far as he wants. Okay, so let's see how we express this using TF Encrypted. And here I just have uh, defined a simple logistic regression model. So this is slightly outdated now because all of this has moved into the framework. Uh, so you don't have to define this yourself. Um, then I just define, again, I use this defined private input saying, okay, there's some data coming from the data owner. In this case, it's the training data and the test data. Uh, I'm going to fit that to my model and I'm going to evaluate it and send back the, uh, each step of the evaluation to the data owner. So in other words, the data owner is now allowed to, essentially seeing in this case, uh, by providing my, my training data, how much did I help improve the model? And that's all he sees. And then finally, we're going to send the resulting model back to the, the model owner. And then we just run this. Okay, so if we inspect this again using TensorFlow or TensorBoard, we can see that we have a private input coming from the data owner. So that's the training data that goes into uh, this fit process uh, where we're training the model. And then afterwards also into the evaluation. And then finally, the output is going to the, to the model owner once we're done with this.
Okay, well, we can also do joint training. So we can take the data from several parties and we can, we can say we want to now train on the joint data set. So we might have the situation where several uh, data owners goes together. They each have part of the training data. They now essentially swap shares of the training data. Then they run an interactive process uh, of actually doing the training and they end up with shares of the, of the weights. If we want to use, express this using TF encrypted, it's also very easy. Uh, we're going to have two data owners here. We're now explicitly going to say, uh, we now know who the data owner are. We now know who's actually going to do the secure computation. We're going to specify saying, okay, I want now a secure computation to happen between these two data owners. Uh, this was implicit before, but here we want to, to make sure it's, it really happens between these two. Then we just ask for the inputs. Again, we concatenate this, and then we can continue as we, as we did before. Okay. Uh, the final example I want to talk about is how to, to use this in federated learning. So the examples we've seen so far, when you want to train uh, a model on this, you're actually sending the shares of your model around. So that means if the model, or sorry, if the, if the training data is large, then you're sending a lot of shares around. So there's a lot of data being exchanged over the network. And in some cases, it's, it's more efficient to actually share uh, the model instead uh, and keep the data local uh, where, uh, with the data owners. All right, and in those cases, federated learning is, uh, is a good approach. The basic setup here is again we have some data owners on the on the left, we have some a model owner on the right, and now he wants to essentially improve the model he already has um, by training on the data of the data owners. And in federated learning, we're not often not worried about actually leaking the model. That's been a concern so far. But in federated learning, we're okay to actually share the model with with the data owners. So that's what he does. He sends the weights over to each of these data owners. Then they train a local update to the model, so a local gradient. And now they could send these updates directly to, back to the model owner and say, okay, here's my updates. He would then take an aggregate or an average of these and then update his model. But in some cases, you can also get some privacy benefits by saying, we're not going to reveal the individual updates on their own because that would lead too much. We're only going to, we only want to reveal and aggregate across all the data owners of the updates to the weights. And for, for computing that, that aggregate, uh, we can use secure computation event. So here we have some service that's now part of, of the training process, and we have this helper. They can then run this secure computation on the, uh, the updates, the shares of the updates, to arrive at an aggregated update, so share of the aggregated updates. And they then send back to the model owner, who can reconstruct, update the weights, and then uh, keeps iterating this process. If you want to express this in, in using TF encrypted with TensorFlow, uh, we can do something like this. So we say we have one model owner. Uh, we have uh, three data owners in this case. They each build a model locally on their devices by asking the model owner what, what does the model look like we're dealing with. Once that's done, we ask each data owner to compute gradients based on the current value of the model. We then essentially take an average, in this case, on the secret shared values. And we send this back to uh, the model owner and ask him to update the model uh, based on this, this average. And then we just run this um, at the bottom for, for uh, any number of iterations we want. If we look at this in Tensible, this is what we see. So we have the model owner at the bottom at the top. Uh, we have the data owners providing these private inputs, so that's the training data. And then we have the two servers, uh, the, the, this, um, this cloud and the helper, to actually compute the secure aggregate. Now, if we were to open one of these private inputs, we would see that we're actually using ordinary TensorFlow within this. So here's here's a clear mix between ordinary TensorFlow that, that takes the current parameters, then runs uh, a training step uh, using Keras in this case. And then when that's done, then they output shares of the model updates into the secure aggregation that then does uh, some of the protocols we've seen earlier and then sends the share back to the output process. Okay, so just to wrap this up, um, it is indeed possible to compute on encrypted data without the ability to decrypt. When you start to do privacy preserving machine learning, you can potentially mitigate some of the bottlenecks that might otherwise happen if you're working on, on sensitive data. And you can actually essentially uh, enable access to some of this. Uh, one way of seeing secret computation is that it distributes trust and control. So we saw that uh, you can now say, uh, I only want, I, I trust that the helper is not going to collaborate too much with the prediction service or the training service. Um, and then as long as that trust assumption is correct, then my data has not been leaked. Or if I want, I can also 
take the role of the helper and say, I want to control how this data is being used. And as long as I essentially trust myself, then my data can't be misused. We also saw that it's very complementary to differential privacy, that they're solving two slightly different problems, and they work very nicely together. Um, however, we also saw that in order to advance this field, we need adaptations on both sides. So there's all the cryptography, as I said, but there's also the machine learning, what, which models uh, work well in the encrypted space. How can we make them more efficient? To some extent, secure computation is a new computational device, um, where if you're trying to do whatever you do on a normal CPU in plain text or even on a GPU, uh, you're not going to get the best results. So you really have to see this as a, as a new type of computational device on which we can do machine learning. And of course, we would then need to adapt the machine learning to this computational device as well. And then finally, uh, we believe that the, that the next big step in actually uh, trying to get this into to more mainstream use uh, is to focus on usability and integration. So that's why TF Encrypted aims at being very similar to ordinary TensorFlow, allowing you to mix so you don't have an all or nothing approach. It's really you can take bits and pieces uh, as you wish um, and not having to understand all the cryptography that's going on uh, underneath, uh, but still be able to apply this. For those that's interested, there's more information on our GitHub uh, or on Twitter. And then I'll just say thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, we, we do have um, a few questions lined up. Um, so um, the first question is, um, Ali Reza is asking, how, how does this affect the performance of a model? Uh, I think he's like talking about like practically speaking. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So I think a rule of thumb is that um, it will be one or two orders of magnitude slower when you're doing this. Um, so that's another reason why uh, I'm saying that I don't think an all or nothing approach is the right approach because you're going to have to pick parts of the process that you say, okay, this is where I'm dealing with the most sensitive data or this is the most critical part of my process. And then I'm going to do that in the encrypted space and I'm going to do the rest on, on plain text data. Um, one of the big factors in this, this overhead is of course, um, if we're talking about homomorphic encryption, it's about the computation. So the computations um, are now happening in a domain where the numbers are much larger. Um, so there is this, which then brings a computational overhead. If we're talking secret sharing, uh, then it's the communication that we sometimes have between the parties. Uh, that's the overhead. So as both computation and communication improves uh, on the hardware side, uh, we're also going to see improvements here um, on the on the encrypted side or the uh, the training side. Okay. Cool. So Alice is asking how uh, how do the helper and the prediction server receive the input and weights in a TF, a TF encrypted. So we're actually using, um, at least for, for the largest part, we're actually using the fact that, that the TensorFlow engine has a distributed component to it. So you can use this for, normally you would use this for distributed training, where you can, you can pin certain tensors and certain operations to specific devices in your cluster. And we're actually using that to say, when we build these graphs that represent an encrypted computation, we can, we can pin some of those to specific devices and then use the TensorFlow distributed engine to actually take care of both the orchestration, but also the communication between those, those nodes, um, which saves a lot of, um, doing that, we can, we can kind of, we can take advantage of all the engineering efforts that Google is putting into TensorFlow uh, to help essentially deal with all these problems about how do you orchestrate interactive computations? How do you make networking efficient and so on and so on? Um, some of the results we've seen is that this approach uh, compared to, let's say, a, a more native or custom implementation using C or C++, uh, we can actually match that performance uh, even if we're writing things in, in Python or, or the high level lang languages because we have this, this efficient optimized uh, engine underneath uh, coming from TensorFlow. Um, so concretely, you'll see if you look in the source code, uh, there's many places where we're saying, okay, with tf.device, do this operation, um, which also makes the code much more easy to read. Um, and it kind of outsources all the, yeah, all the communication optimizations to, to TensorFlow. Okay. Um, are there examples using MPC or using one processor as helper and the other as the prediction server? Uh, so we have, you can, you can run TF encrypted in two configurations. So one is more the, the debug configuration that's, that's easy to run on your, on your laptop. And what we do there is we, we actually simulate uh, several parties or several players running on your laptop. 
uh, so you can still get the right security. Uh, I mean, you're not getting security, but you can still see that you're getting the that the right parties are running the right computations and so on. Uh, and then we have another configuration uh, where you can easily switch, where we're actually running this in a cluster. So there you're going to you're going to have several machines. On each machine, machine you fire up a TensorFlow server, um, and then we orchestrate the communication between those. Um, so there's kind of a trade-off between. Well, there's a first phase where you, if you're playing with it, you can do it easily on your laptop, and then when you want to uh, to actually get a, a good estimate of the performance, uh, you can switch to a cluster setting uh, and run it on different machines. Okay. Um, do, uh, do you have any comments, uh, or can you explain a little bit on scalability as well? Um, so there is, uh, there is of course these, all these computational overheads uh, that we just talked about. Um, there's also some operations. So we do have a some a good set of operations that you can do in the encrypted space, but there's also some operations that that will be very expensive and that we actually haven't implemented yet. In principle, it's possible to do any operation. Um, the problem is that for some of them, it, the overhead is much larger, uh, and we're trying to avoid them. So some type of some types of machine learning is going to be more efficient than others. Uh, deep learning is particularly nice because it kind of does a nice overlap between the operations you would perform in deep learning and the ones that are efficient in, in encrypted computations. Whereas if you're doing, uh, for instance, decision trees uh, or something like this, uh, where you have a lot of branching, for instance, uh, that would be that would be more expensive to do. Um, so uh, if you're staying with relatively simple models. Uh, or simple, let's say, it's layers in a neural network, it can scale somewhat nicely. Um, but as the data size increases, as the model size increases, as the model complexity increases, uh, you're going to to run into some uh, some limitations at some point in terms of, of how long it actually takes to run this. Okay, um, Morgan, um, I, I don't is asking. I don't quite understand the quite. But let, let me try to rephrase it. I think he's uh, he's asking if. TF encrypted, a feature available in, is in, in the, is it a feature in TensorFlow only, or, like I think he's basically asking like is it available for another framework for like PyTorch. Okay, okay, um, so we've so far we only built it for uh, for TensorFlow, um, hence the TF encrypted. Uh, there is another project um, by OpenMind uh, which we're collaborating with um, that have a, a similar thing for PyTorch. Um, that project is slightly more focused around federated learning, uh, whereas we we kind of focus more on the cluster setting, uh, where you have several powerful servers next to each other, uh, and you want to do an, uh, let's say predictions or training uh, in the encrypted space, as opposed to just doing uh, federated learning. Um, you can also do some encrypted computations with with Py, uh, in in uh, PyTorch using this this project from OpenMind. Um, and there is a there is a bridge between them, so you can actually access TF encrypted from the open mind project, uh, as long as you run TensorFlow, um, this it will clearly come for more platforms. Um, but right now, we we chose to focus on TensorFlow because of the both of the engine underneath, um, also the maturity, the availability, and so on. Um, PyTorch is also very interesting, and I'm sure some of the other platforms will will have uh, stuff as well. Um, I know there's a group at Intel. That's been working on doing similar things for NGraph, so there's the kind of compiler framework for deep learning networks, uh, and I'm sure it will come to to other frameworks uh, down the line as well. Okay, um, uh, Douglas is asking, uh, how do you ass how do you assess the accuracy of the model? So, uh, in principle, you're doing the same computation, so that means that the accuracy will remain uh, uh, for practical purposes the same. However, there are some optimizations you want to do. So, for instance, um, computing the ReLU can be can be a bit expensive because you're doing a, a comparison, and it turns out a comparison is, is expensive to do in the encrypted space. So, um, what's actually better sometimes is to either switch to a sigmoid, which is easy to approximate, or to actually approximate the ReLU. But as soon as you start doing that, as soon as you use these approximations, then it can have an impact on accuracy. And where the where the machine learning researchers, for instance, can 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 really help this process is to figure out how can we uh, how can we use approximations in our model, uh, because that's going to speed up everything. Um, so uh, there is still 
the first version we had of TF Encrypted was very low level in the sense that it matched, let's say, the, the version one of TensorFlow, uh, where you had this kind of low level operations, as you saw in some of the slides. And one of the things we noticed there is that uh, people will come in and they will start using ReLUs, for instance, all over the base or ArcMax. And these turns out to be expensive operations. So you get a significant performance hit when you go from, from the plain text to the encrypted computations. And uh, one thing we're trying to encourage people to do is to say, well, maybe you can use an approximation of sigmoid instead. Uh, maybe that means adding more batch normalization, for instance, to your, to your network. Um, but then you're going to get a speed up. But kind of encoding this knowledge into the framework and saying, uh, we already have these, uh, we already done some research on how to nicely use approximations to get good accuracy. Um, to kind of communicate that to, to the new user uh, is one of the things we're focusing on now. And we're doing that by saying we want to move things up on a higher level. So we're going to provide a more Keras like interface instead. Um, and we're also going to provide some essentially pre trained models that's already been adapted to the machine learning setting or to the encrypted setting. Um, to provide good accuracy uh, using approximations, for instance. Um, so it, I know it's not a very clear answer, but it, it's essentially uh, that's some of the interaction between the cryptography and the machine learning. Like how do we how do we maintain good accuracy while we also uh, get good performance? Okay, uh, you may have uh, mentioned this, but if people were want to try uh, TF encrypted today, uh, how would you recommend that, that them start? Like where do they start? Uh, yeah, good question. So you can go on the on the on the GitHub uh, GitHub.com slash TF encrypted. Um, the main TF encrypted repository where we have a bunch of examples. Uh, we have a few notebooks uh, that you can try to run. Um, and I think that would be there's also a few links in the README to to articles we have on this. Uh, there's a few tutorials and so on. So I would recommend going to to the GitHub. Uh, we also have a Slack channel. There's a link in the on the, in the README on the GitHub. So how to join the Slack channel. It's focused mostly on the development of TF Encrypted, uh, but of course anyone is, is more than welcome to join, and we'd be more than happy to, to get anyone started or answer, answer any questions. Okay, um, we have one last question. Uh, we're gonna ask, this is a, uh, probably a question at a high level. Um, do you, um, like, do you see, uh, what are some of the future needs for security in machine learning that you see? So there's definitely a lot of interesting uh, going things going on now around um, ethical questions around machine learning. Um, all the uh, yeah, the, yeah, basically the ethical applications of machine learning um, for robustness, for adversarial attacks, for dealing with sensitive information, and so on. Um, and I think um, privacy is is one part of that, um, where we're saying that we can. We can build uh, we can build very interesting systems if we have access to this information, but we also need to do so in a in a responsible manner. Um, and it also needs to make yeah I think it's more that it opens up for new business opportunities um, when we can actually start to do this, where we can start to make these connections where uh, yeah we have access to the data and so on. So I do see that there could be some systems today which are limited by by our inability to actually have access to this data. And I think privacy plays, plays a part in, in being able to even build those systems uh, in a responsible way. Okay, um, thank you very much. And it has been an amazing talk. And actually someone co commented that <laughs> he is amazing on the YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for having me. This was a pleasure. Okay. Um, so. Uh, every uh, people online, um, we're gonna wrap up and thank you, thanks again for joining us. Uh, so we'll, I guess, we'll see you next time. All right, I'm gonna stop.